Yeah. 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 I'm Krishna Woodkori. Uh, I'm a princ principal engineering manager working on the PowerShell project um, at Microsoft in the United States. Today, uh, I'm going to talk about how to product your environment uh, and the advances we made uh, in PowerShell version 5 and Windows 10. And I want to talk. I want to show you um, uh, cool demos, hopefully, to show you like how you can product your environment using PowerShell version five. Before, push the button. Yeah. Did you push the button? Yeah, yeah I did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Don't push it again. <laughs> yeah, that's why I just want to make sure. Yeah, I pushed it once, and I saw two red lights um, yeah. blinking. Yeah. Okay. So before we start, I want to explain two concepts. Um, exploitation. Exploitation is there is a vulner vulnerability on the system, and a hacker can a hacker can exploit the system. So uh, you can install, uh, you can get security updates to prevent exploitation. The second point I want to discuss is post exploitation. Post exploitation means a hacker is already on your system. For the purpose of this discussion, post exploitation means hacker is controlling your operating system. So once hacker is the operating system, he can get your passwords, he can do a lot of bad things. So PowerShell by default, since version one of PowerShell, PowerShell is secure by default. So we had, uh, uh, when PowerShell version one is shipped, uh, the execution policy was restricted. That means no scripts, I mean only signed scripts were allowed to exe uh, execute. But with PowerShell uh, version four, we have changed it to remote signed, that means uh, if you download something from internet, those won't be executed. But by default, PowerShell is secure. So in this era, all um, there are different kind of security controls the administrators and IT pros um, uh, they want to enable in their uh, to protect their data center. So <clears throat> by default, the accepted version is like antivirus. You run antivirus on your assets and that protects your system. And um, we have this, this thing called app, lock, app Locker. With App Locker, you can uh, deny um, applications, specific applications that uh, you don't want to run on your systems. And then another version is app, lock, app Locker in LO mode. You basically whitelist, hey, I want only these apps to run on my system. Okay, in spite of doing all these productions, right? So they, you have to prepare for situations where hacker has exploited and is on your system. So for that, there is next set of tools that security experts use to detect what, what kind of uh, things the hacker is exploiting on your system. For that security folks, they use a forensic capture of the host based artifacts and forensic capture of memory based artifacts. If you have uh, seen uh, Blue Hat or any other security uh, conferences, there are cases where uh, the security experts go on stage and then show uh, how cool is PowerShell to uh, use for hacking. PowerShell is, is secure by default, but till PowerShell v4, um, a hacker, once the system is exploited, he can run something in PowerShell and without leaving any trace. But that is changing with PowerShell 5. We have put a lot of systems uh, in place to, uh, once the system is exploited, right? PowerShell is default by secure. Once the system, system is exploited, you can use this uh, techniques, techniques to um, look at like what, what are the things that the hacker a has access to on your system. Before I proceed, um, have you seen code like this? Can anybody? Uh, spot a fault in this code? Oh yeah. 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 So have you seen invoke expression here? Yeah. So I want to uh, make a note about invoke expression. <laughs> so invoke expression, although this looks correct, here get process name dollar name and dollar name you are taking input from the user and this script has some kind of validation not match PowerShell, but with with a simple semicolon, you can do a lot of bad stuff in this. The guidance is don't use invoke expression in your uh, in uh, in your scripts. Okay, invoke invoke expression is 
invoke expression is bad. Okay, <laughs> but using invoke expression, you can do. S I mean, I'll I'll explain for I'll explain further. In general, what we invoke expression means pwned. <laughs> okay, <laughs> you're pwned. So instead, instead of using invoke expression, here PowerShell has this technique called splatting. So where you can say uh, <coughs> my parameter name is path and the uh, value of the path is this. And you can use that technique uh, using um, the unpresent operator, <coughs> command name and parameters. In most of the cases, this pattern should work. Okay, wherever, instead of using invoke expression, you use eval, command name and parameters, like splatting, splatting. This technique should work in most of the cases. Okay, but there might be some cases where administrators legitimately want to do dynamic evaluation. Okay, for those cases, we have added ability called this, we have added a new API, system management automation language code generation. In this, we have added a couple of functions like escape single quoted string content, escape block comment content. So, PowerShell has this um, weird thing about backtick, right? So you uh, basically uh, for parser you have to to escape you have to put a backtick. For uh, providers you have to put a backtick you uh, to escape path. So for those cases, if you expect quotes in a string content that is passed by the user, the recommended way is to use this es es escape single quoted string content. That can that can, that can correctly escape uh, characters. Okay, so by default, don't use invoke expression. We understand that there are legitimate cases where invoke expression needs to be used. In those cases, before sending uh, the the parameter, the, the string that you take from the user, we encourage you to use one of these escape methods to protect the uh, user input. Do you have an example using those? Uh, the I don't have any examples, but I can send you offline. Do you want to include a warning message with Info Expression for, to de-emphasize for new users? So the question is, uh, do we include warning message to, uh, to de-emphasize the use of invoke Expression? So we explored that approach, but the uh, feedback that we got is too many warnings when you run the command <laughs> is actually creating pain. So what we did is we have something called script analyzer, which somebody, which which uh, one of the speakers <laughs> is going to talk about. There is a uh, ability using script analyzer to catch uh, instance of uh, like invoke expression usage. Okay, but since when I, I started out with PowerShell invoke expression v1, of course, yeah, that was what well, yeah, the chainsaw method, right? But when you start learning PowerShell, this is probably one of the first uh, commands you you get into. Yeah. Yeah, so with PowerShell version 1, we don't have the splatting technique that we ended, uh, with, uh, we showed. So that's why uh, if you see some of the blogs and some of the uh, early content you use, uh, you see invoke expression like if you Bing or Google, you, you, you see some blogs about invoke expression, but once we learned the uh, bad things that are happening, we are recommending nowadays to not use invoke expression. Yeah, sh shouldn't you make that apparent for new users, for newbies? Uh, most current education material still cover it quite extensively. Current education. They're learning it wrong, basically. Okay, so we tried putting this in a warning for invoke expression, but then we got feedback saying that the warnings are uh, limiting, but we'll explore that uh, big yeah, warnings. That's yeah. just one solution. Uh, yeah. Maybe we'll get another. Other documentation or how what. Yeah, people, people, the right people want to know if you want the problem. Right. People don't seem to get that they're doing ex, uh, uh, SQL in uh, mm -hmm. basically the same injection. It's the same problem. People just need to know that that's okay. why it's bad. Okay. Yeah. And, and you newbies might not know that. Okay. So we'll explore uh, different ways of educating uh, um, the newbies about about it. Maybe like set the execution policy, actually. Oh, that's a good point, actually. So set execution policy, we have different modes, constraint yeah. language mode, uh, restricted language mode. Mm -hmm. So yeah. in constraint language mode restricts uh, usage of the script evaluation, but that is not on by default. I'll touch base on when constraint language mode is turned on. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
And if they're getting a lot of warning messages, hey, then do you're probably doing something wrong. So, but there are some cases, yeah, where where uh, Invoke Express was registered. Yeah, but you can override it with a. Yeah? You can override it when you invoke expression command. You can have a warning preference. To, you can turn it off. For that, yeah, yeah. That call, right? Yeah. So maybe that is a technique. We'll explore those and then we'll uh, try to uh, in, uh, interact with you and then yeah. find so it's, it's okay to make it harder for people. If you really need to use it and you know it's okay, you probably can figure out to turn off the warning message. Okay, okay. sounds good. Yeah, we'll explore, we'll explore that again. Okay, Tobias. Is there any way of uh, making it safe to read in hash tables? You know, because some people use invoke expression to take, a, to take a PSD1 content and turn it into a hash table, but that's dangerous, of course, because we yeah. The same injection. So, is there a uh, safe way of using hash tables or PSD1 files as data only? Uh, there is an attribute, isn't there, that's available to come out with um, version 4 that you can assign to a parameter and it will take a PSD1 string or a hash table. There is no. I, no, I, there's, I got there's no. Yeah, I, for hash table reading, there is, I, I don't think there is a uh, way yeah. to. In, but in data language mode, PSD1 files, right? there is something called data language. We evaluate as a data language mode. Yeah. So yeah. in data language mode, you cannot do a lot of things. It is already restricted. Yeah. So June, do you have a question? Yeah. Does this warning apply to the invoke operator as well? Uh, this, uh, no, the question is there is no warning right now. The Sorry, solution is to use. warning, but does yeah. the, is, is the security, does the security um, vulnerability also apply to the invoke? No, it's invoke expression. Invoke expression Only, is more. So how invoke. does invoke expression differ from invoke operator so that invoke expression invoke expression will run anything, but won't the invoke operator as well? So here see there is command name and parameters. So right. only command gets sent and the others are treated as parameters. Right. So parameters, there is a concept of parameter name and value. Right, right, right. So it's uh, Right. So there it's limited there to is what limited. the parameter would take. So you couldn't put in a whole bunch of Yeah, of random code, stuff, yeah. Right. Here, explicitly we say this is the command that we are running. Right, but that's, that's splatting parameters. But the invoke operator can be used when you're just to run a line of code, right? Or code in a script no. block. No. Invoke expression, you have to dynamic evaluation is invoke expression. A script block you can run with. Huh? A script block you can run yeah. with. Yeah, sure. Do it yeah. the time. So yeah, that but, but it's not vulnerable to injection. It's yeah, it's okay. not vulnerable. Oh, okay, so it's vulnerable mm -hmm. but not to yeah, not doing just yeah. yeah, and then the other here, uh, the problem that I showed here is you directly are taking input from the user. This is directly taking from the user. That cannot happen. Sure. So yes, you have a question. Is, is planting um, safe in terms of uh, using these direct variables, dollar parent? Mm -hmm. Yeah, <coughs> this okay. one. Right. So, so if I have path equals dollar parents and then some expression, it wouldn't evaluate the expression. It's, it's evaluated as parameter value. So yeah. it's not like a it's command. Yeah, okay, but when I have default parameters and I use dollar in parents, then it will execute these. And uh, when I um, draw, when I pull the default parameter value, and so I was wondering if that is uh, excluded here. Oh, sub expression. Yeah. Sub expression? No, that is not excluded here. Yeah. But then sub expression would still be a way for me. Sub sub expression will still be a way. Yeah. But if if you're accepting user input. So like if there's dollar parentheses in, in a string, that's that doesn't get executed. That's only if there's if that's actually in your code. So if you dollar string and then execute get process here, it will execute. Yeah. So but then if you're accepting that as user input, <coughs> then uh, um, dollar dollar value, right? So double dollar it will it will be evaluated. Right. Well I'm just saying that if, if the user input text has something that happens to look like PowerShell code, it's not going to get executed as PowerShell code, even if it has what looks like a sub-expression syntax. It's still just a string. Well, it depends on how you query from the user. Yeah. If the user is able to type in dollar parents, then we can execute anything. Uh, well, it, it would execute, that would evaluate before it gets to your function. So yes. the user can run whatever they run. It would be evaluated, but that is exactly what I want. It would then run. Before it gets to the function, because it will yeah, it will be executed. It will be executed. Right, but it's not. Um, it's not the same type of injection vulnerability where they can pass yeah. a malformed string to your code and your code. So code. you cannot put another like semicolon and then put all those tricks. Yeah, the but semicolon would then be the sub right? That will not get. A, that will not get treated as a command. 
So we talk about uh, escaping. So whenever you whenever you take user input and pass to script, we recommend to use one of these escape methods. So today I'm going to talk about uh, the three improvements that we made uh, uh, with respect to uh, PowerShell version five. One of them was system-wide transcripts, script block logging, and anti-mal anti-malware integration. <coughs> so let's jump on to a, a demo. <coughs> So, how many of you use transcript? So, So I have two screens here, let me So you, before PowerShell 5, you can, anybody can start transcript uh, like this. Um, and then you basically run some commands, right? Like get process, p star, like that, right? With PowerShell 5, we made uh, improvements to transcript logging, wherein um, earlier, there, are, there were a lot of complaints that uh, in ISC, you cannot do transcripts. But with PowerShell 5, you can start transcripts in ISC. Not only in ISC, any app, like if you have a third party app written that is hosting PowerShell using PowerShell API, now you get transcripting for that also without the app developer doing anything. Okay, so you have a app that is written using PowerShell in PowerShell 1, 2, 3, with 5 you can enable um, transcription for those also. And we went one step further, we added uh, group policy for uh, uh, transcription. So we have a new group policy called turn on PowerShell transcription. So here you can enable it and then you can say, hey, I want all the transcripts for all the PowerShell sessions running on this, on this machine to be output to this directory here. It can be on a network share. So all the machines on your data center, you can enable uh, transcripts and then you can log them here in this uh, output. Can it be the same share for multiple? Yeah, it can be the same share. So I have a demo here to show exactly that. <coughs> so before I move forward, I have written this script called uh, security.psm1. I will share this script with you after, uh, the, after the summit here, like probably early next week. So this script, this module, has command that's called enable transcription. Enable transcription, disable transcription. I will share with, with you uh, after the summit. So using this, I can enable <coughs> enable transcription. And then I'm saying like, I want all the transcripts to be in this directory. <coughs> so we have, uh, again, transcripts can work with um, uh, any PowerShell hosted in any application, not just PowerShell.exe, PowerShell IFC. Uh, mm, it, can, it can work with any, any of the applications. So here, technically, I can use the Visual Studio uh, to write this code and then compile. But then I'm using uh, uh, the goodness of add type in PowerShell to compile an application, like add type. And this is the code. And then if 
if I run this script, this is ignorant uh, transcript that just compiled this into this function for uh, 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 executable called ignorant transcriber mm -hmm. WFC. If I run this script, so it's giving me like you have 20 sound process with uh, uh, S. That is the command that uh, the executable used. Now I said, uh, now let me disable the transcription. And then uh, all the transcripts are stored in this directory. See, temp transcripts in, my, in, in this example. So you can see this, this got created. Right. Now you can, with PowerShell 5, we have added this additional header information, like username, run as user. So there are <coughs> cases where PowerShell is executing on somebody else's behalf. So that's why we added run as user, and the machine name, and the process ID, and the uh, transcript information. So again, this transcript logging works with uh, any application where PowerShell is hosted. The application developer does not need to do anything. The administrators need to enable it using group policy, or uh, they can use start transcript commands. Now, this, this log is from your PowerShell.exe, or is yeah. it from your, from your other app? So this is the one. You have the application name, like, done in transcript.exe. Is this built for being run on production servers? It's yeah. It will create a lot of logs. Mm -hmm. So redirect to a share, and then try to clean up uh, when you don't need it. This space is cheap. Uh, true, yeah, yeah, but but, uh, but looking through locks is not. Well, actually, it's a great point. Yeah. So this augments um, a date of venting, right? Mm -hmm. So venting's great. You'll see some more of that later, yeah. and it's great for big data analytics, right? So you go and find some abnormality. But logs aren't particularly good for like, okay, well, I saw something was weird was happening. What was really going on? Transcripts are great for that. And so you can use the information from the log to then go find the right transcript and you can see who did what, when, what did they do before it, what did they do after it. Yeah. Very valuable. So you can, technically right, you can send all this data <coughs> to cloud and use some of the tools also to uh, evaluate and then throw away the data. Well, it's also just a great way to, to yeah. uh, uh, learn PowerShell because as you're messing around with stuff, you know, you try this, you try this, you try this, and you're like, oh, I figured that out like 10 minutes ago. What did I do? And with the transcripts, <laughs> you're like, oh, yeah. that's when I got it right. That's um, what so was that uh, your module to start to enable transcriptions? Was that using GPMC, or was it doing it on the user now, or was it doing it, you couldn't have been doing it on the computer? That's so that's a good question. Like easy. what the enable PS transcription is doing? So this is the security.ps1 M1 module that I will share with you. Here it's basically a bunch of registry keys. So it will add those registry keys. Okay, so yeah. basically it's bypassing. It's doing the registry hacks that you do. So registry keys. Put it on the user? On the user? Yeah. No, it's on the local machine. On the local machine. machine. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So from so the next from session, or will it work on the session where you run? Yeah. Pardon me? Will the logging start as soon as you run it or in the next uh, PowerShell session? So that's a good point. Will the logging start, if I enable PS transcription, will the logging start in the current session or the next session? It will start from the next session. So at the startup <coughs> of the PowerShell, uh, we'll read the registry key and then enable the login. Uh, if the remote folder is not accessible, will, will it hold, will it cache the logs uh, locally and send it afterwards or will it just go out into black space? So uh, <laughs> the question is if the remote uh, is not available, what yeah. will happen? Uh, the answer is um, it, will, uh, uh, it will log in the event log saying that something happened but it will not crash the PowerShell process. And not cache it uh, and send yeah. it later, no. Yeah. It will only give an error in the PowerShell folder. Uh, For the, the event console, log. Uh, yeah. the console, the console. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so as an attacker, I will just uh, yeah kill the logging machine. But that's Hold on to that. that I will show you some. <laughs> I will show you some of the techniques. Okay. Yeah, the host part. Yeah, <laughs> true. A as an attacker, could you circumvent this uh, transcripting just by starting PowerShell with the version two parameter or version three so or something like that? 
That's clever. So, uh, as an attacker, can you? Put yeah, if I was an attacker uh, yeah. getting on a box and I wanted to, uh, to uh, run some malicious PowerShell code, could I get around the whole transcripting thing by just starting PowerShell with the dash version 2.0 parameter? Yeah. yeah. This, this transcripting is available only from PowerShell 2. Like, as, as the engine startup, PowerShell 5 engine detects that um, transcript needs to be logged. So it is for, since for, only for PowerShell 5. But the PowerShell version 2 is, is only there if you choose to install it. It's yeah. not by default. So. Yeah, but can you, can you just, I mean, normally you can just run PowerShell XC with the dash version. No, no, the, the, the only thing that that actually affects is version 2 and only if you've installed that feature. E even if you tell it to run dash version 3, you're getting 5 because it's mm -hmm. the same assembly. Okay. They're, they're, yeah. they're, those are in-place upgrades, 3, 4, and 5 of the same files, but version 2 is in a different target for the DOM framework, so they can actually exist side by side. Okay, thanks. Yeah, PowerShell 2 also request .NET 3.5, there is a download, so you would know if PowerShell version 2 is run or not. It is oh, by the way, Ian, okay. to do that, you'll have, launched, you'll have run PowerShell to do that, you'll say PowerShell, we'll see that. In general, so then that's a, a signature, you know, an indicator of suspicious behavior. In general, what you're going to find is it becomes, one of the problems with uh, intrusion detection is that the bad guy and the good guy look very similar. Mm -hmm. And what you can see with these things are the bad guy has to start now start to do things that are very different than a regular user would do. Right. So, so it's easier to find. One, you have one question? Yeah, is this running in uh, the PC context or the user context? The so logging, the transcripting? Starting in the user, I mean, in the, it's starting in the application. So if the application is running as user context, it's running in the user context. We don't launch a different system. Yeah, not, not, not the XFile, but the, the transcripting. It's the PC <coughs> that needs to get access to the share, or it's the user that has to get access to the share. User. The user has to get access to the okay. server. Yeah. So, so a hacker could just delete the transcript. Yeah. So I will tell you some of the other techniques. Can you? Um, I'll t tell you some of the techniques um, to uh, overcome that. Okay. So one last question. Okay. Um, so if someone is making an implicit remoting connection to this server, yeah, will it transcribe what they've done? Yep. Okay. It okay. Will. Because actually, I want to use it. For yeah, it will transcribe. Like so let's move on. Uh, just can you <laughs> check if uh, if it's running? If I log on to a box, can I see if logging is enabled? Um, check the registry key. Yeah. Registry key. I mean, okay, it's that's, a box. that's how an attacker will see if he's being locked. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <coughs> also, in the event log, the moment the transcript starts, uh, something is written in the event log. Oh. Okay. Let's move on. So now there is a lot of discussion around attackers, right? So transcripting, uh, it's basically basically logging the command line, what you're typing on the command line, not the output of it. So on the command line, uh, an attack, if an attacker, now, <coughs> this, right? <coughs> now they are hiding what commands that they are running, totally hiding what commands they are running. So for example, right, um, PowerShell can run PowerShell, obviously, uh, um, as you know, like I can do PowerShell get process. Okay. This is PowerShell running another process with get process, right? So we ha I, I will show you a cheat here. Um, command C echo. <coughs> I do this. This is same PowerShell but with some encoded command here, some alphabets here. This is basically a base64 version of uh, the same command, like get process base64 version. So if you, if you enable transcript, in the transcript you will see, hey, this is being run, but you don't know what is being run, right? I mean, once the system is exploited, you don't know what is being run. So with PowerShell 5, we have, we have enabled script block logging. So what we do is, at some, point of at some point of time, PowerShell engine has to convert this to actual script and actually run that script. So at that point, once the, once the conversion happened, we actually started logging what exactly is being done. So this, all, this technique will come, uh, come to like, uh, uh, useful, come become useful when you are doing forensic analysis, once the exploit happens, once you're doing analysis, like what all things that the hacker has accessed on your system. Okay? I really don't get what that line was doing. Mm -hmm. yeah. Why did you get the encoded command? It's cool, cool, but what's happening? <laughs> okay, so you understood, you followed this, right? PowerShell get process. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Definitely, right? <laughs> so, 
Sita. There are cases where PowerShell uh, uh, command line contains backtick spaces yeah. and all those things, right? Yeah. So, in, for practical purposes, when you are sending this command to another machine or web URI, you don't want uh, this um, uh, uh, codes or double double text like it's very, it will it will become easily become very complex. For that reason, you encode that into in, into format 64, like yes. encode it. And PowerShell is actually if I Run this command. Uh, run, run this command like this. It's actually running the same command. It's converting. Is it is converting the encoded command back to get process PowerShell. Yes. Okay. So it, this this technique will come in handy in cases where uh, you have a complex backticking spaces and all those things. So. So you use this technique to overcome putting a lot of backticks, basically. Backticks or other escaping characters. I'm wondering how you got Echo to do that. To yeah. oh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a cheat in PowerShell. Uh, I mean, whenever you send to native commands, we do that. Uh, so when you see PowerShell in the squiggle brackets, yeah. we auto-transcode it to this. Yeah. And, and so then the question is, well, how are you ever going to find it? And it turns out if you do that Echo command, it's a little trick to make it. It's a little trick, yeah. So we've already it will expand it to this, and then you launch command dash echo, and it shows you the real command. Uh, uh, yeah. Sneaky. <laughs> <laughs> so Tobias, you have it. That, that's awesome. I didn't know that. When, when, you, when you add that PowerShell, it's in PowerShell five, I believe. Oh, oh no, I think it's PowerShell one. Yeah. I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why don't you block that stuff? Yeah. It's cool. <laughs> Security module. I have this command called enable ps script login. Mm -hmm. So now I will use, I will show you the same thing in action. Okay. Here I am basically clearing the event log, enabling ps script log login. Again, uh, we have a group policy to uh, enable <coughs> to enable turn on PowerShell script log login for the entire system. Yeah. So with PowerShell 5 and Windows 10, you can turn on PowerShell script log login. For your entire system. Wait, okay. Which ADMX file is that in? It's in Windows PowerShell. And it's released. That and ADMX it's in Windows 10. Okay. Windows 10 and PowerShell 5. So disable script block logging. And uh, in the context of this, um, and all the script block logging stuff, the new stuff, is with ID 4104. Okay, so here you can see script, uh, creating script block, and then we have this get process name. Uh, I think I didn't clear the stuff, but you get that you have the expanded script instead of the encoded command, and you can see uh, the formatting uh, and the formatting uh, instructions also here within the same thing. The thing to remember is ID four one zero four. It's a new ID that we added with PowerShell five and Windows ten. Um, how much of this stuff works yeah. in PowerShell 5 on down-level operating systems? So all this stuff, the question is how much of this stuff works on PowerShell <coughs> 5 on Windows 7, Windows 8, and uh, uh, Windows 2 get or 2, right? All of this stuff works on PowerShell 5. So it's just the, uh, the antivirus integration that requires Windows 10? Yeah. Okay. <coughs> yeah. Wasn't some of this made available for PowerShell 4? So the question is, is this available with PowerShell 4? You will have November so, of the So there is a, yeah, that's a good question, that's a good point. Um, we had uh, a November update with the Windows 2012 R2 and this stuff is available with that and uh, we are working on an update for Windows 4 update that works on like Windows 7 so it will this will also come become available with Windows 4 update too. So I will I showed you a simple ca example with encoded command. So now I will show you a complex uh, uh, example. Here, I'm clearing the event. Technically, I want to show you the com com complex example by doing this. This is invoke web request and a HTTP URL. Like a hacker typically gets stuff from internet, specifically written for your machine. I know that 
So I was worried about uh, the internet access on this uh, on this machine. Uh, uh, so I used my own local file here. So yeah, your sound turned up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let me see. to respond right like what to do now so now since we enabled uh, script block logging all this stuff is in um, my event logs so although the system is spawned you can debug what happened on the system right so remember the ID number is 4104 so I took ID 4104 and we have a new command that called set clipboard with power so I Taking all the messages with ID 4104, setting it to the clipboard, like you know, it's on the clipboard. <coughs> now, since it's in the clipboard, I can do Control V. So this script is basically trying to download um, this content, data content from website, and uses. <coughs> So a lot of data and uses uh, zzip stream and uh, some other techniques to draw stuff okay so but using uh, step block logging you can uh, let me see. no the data was uh, didn't copy a lot of stuff but you can see all the all the things that happened on the system so this is your operating system is pwned, like because of an exploitation. With the strip block login, you can get what exactly happened on the system. I think you had a whole list. I don't think you specified a count. So I don't think you specified enough. It, it grabbed the default number. Anyway. In the uh, <coughs> get when the dash man, you have the dash oldest uh, row. Yeah, if you, if you add oldest uh, 30 or 40. about hey um, script log logging you are logging what is happening in the scripts now the question is within your scripts since you are um, going to use scripts to manage your data centers there might be a possibility where you are storing some of the sensitive data like usernames sometimes passwords like you are logging it in the logging uh, and um, inadvertently if you are logging you are logging all the credentials or other sensitive data so for that reason we have added new commandlets called uh, related to cryptographic message syntax like CMS it's an RFC uh, standard so we have new command uh, commands called uh, CMS message it's can you a scroll up a little bit? pardon me? can you scroll up a yeah. little bit? thank you <coughs> so we have three new commandlets get CMS message, product CMS message, unproduct CMS message. So using these commandlets, you can product the message. So how I will show you how producting a message looks like. So here I am creating a new self-signed certificate for this system. To product a message, um, you need a public and private uh, uh, signatures. So you basically use uh, your private keys to protect the message and then distribute the public keys to somebody to <coughs> the message. In this example, I'm creating a self-signed certificate that has public portion and private portion both on the system, on the same system. But uh, in reality, you will have a private portion of the certificate only on uh, the system that you trust and share the public portion. 
okay so i created a certificate a uh, self signed certificate that is uh, with cm ps summit europe 2015 at example.com like you can create certificates related to your organization and then Here is an example. Okay, so looks like I have multiple pages. So I have two two certificates with the same name. Let let me remove uh, remove them. So removing with the remove item command let, and then creating the same certificate again. now this is the encrypted message with the certificate so this is this contains the recipient of this product cms message as the recipient so only this person can uh, i mean unprotect that like decrypt that okay and this message contains the uh, recipient address also like if i do get cms message <laughs> dollar key <coughs> you can see this is recipient is summit europe 2015 so if you do get cms messages you have all that data here now i can do unprotect message dollar p again since my machine has both uh, public and private key i can do this stuff but in mm -hmm. on machines where you don't have the proper certificates you may not be able to unprotect Does this technique work with DSC and its small files? Pardon me. Does this technique work with DSC and its small files for storing passwords, credentials? So it can. The question is, does it? Can this work with DSC? It, the product CMS message can take string content, any content it can take, mm -hmm. and then protect it. <coughs> so technically, you can unprotect CMS message. Um, use you can use unprotect CMS mm -hmm. message uh, by getting data from Unix machines also. Like CMS is an open standard. Technically, you can use the same command lets to uh, decrypt information that you encrypted on non-Windows machines. Also, technically, yeah. but DSC doesn't use this for the yeah. uh, encrypting PS credentials. It just encrypts them directly with uh, the certificate. It doesn't do the same. Yeah, DSC, stuff. DSC, good point. DSC uh, does <coughs> DSC credential uh, encryption. It doesn't use uh, this technique. It uses uh, some secure uh, uh, session protocol. Um, To send the credentials to the machine, you you don't want your passwords on your <coughs> MAR files. That's the new and you're really not. No, but I guess you can pass information into DSC protected by this that could only be decrypted by the yeah, the node. Yeah, that's what I'm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the resource would be able to do that though. DSC won't do it for you. Correct. Yeah, DSC by default yeah. won't do it for you. You have to do it. Yeah, but we are looking at a scenario where DSC can encrypt the entire MAR. And basically, we've talked to people who said, "Yeah, I love it. You have a <coughs> nice, secure way to handle uh, uh, credentials. However, there are more secrets than just credentials. And in reality, I'm really not sure what's a secret and what's not. So, could you just enti entirely, you know, encrypt them off? So, we think that's a valid point. You know, API keys and <coughs> uh, yeah. okay. so now um, moving on further, right? We talked about CMS message, protecting the CMS message, unprotecting the CMS message. You can do. I'll. We talked about strip block logging, so we can combine these two techniques basically. So strip block logging, at, at strip block logging, right? You can say, hey, all the stuff that you are logging in the uh, for strip blocks, you can protect them using this technique. So we have a group policy for that. So uh, the protect CMS message works with uh, any. Event log related message, not just PowerShell. So that's why it is in um, uh, eventing uh, event logging. So there is this enable protected event logging group policy setting. So you can use that to say, hey, I want enable protected event logging for any stuff technically. But currently, only PowerShell is using this technique. So if you have situations of other components where you want to Uh, products product data uh, let us know and we'll work with the appropriate team to enable it 
so with the with the security module that i show, uh, showed you right we have a command that called enable um, protected event logging where you can pass in a certificate a path view certificate or a certificate thumbprint or a dynamic uh, uh, certificate file also so you can do that and let me run a script for you i'm creating this certificate here here i'm, I'm taking the certificate clearing the event log running the command calculator <coughs> and i'm also doing the protected uh, event logging for uh, my uh, uh, machine so the application is, is open and then i'm doing this disable protected event logging so i talked about the event id 4104 let us see the content of event id 4104 So this is all protected. So if your script uses sensitive data, you know that this is protected, right? So the general practice is uh, uh, in a data center where you have multiple machines, you basically enable this protected event logging, use event forwarding to forward the events to uh, to your uh, uh, set of machines where you have absolute trust, and uh, use this unprotected, unprotected <coughs> message to uh, decipher the data. Uh, how uh, can you um, mm -hmm. un unprotect an entire block like that? Where yeah, I will show you that technique. The next command is this. <laughs> so where I'm saying, see, get the event operational oldest, mm -hmm. event ID 4104, and here I'm unprotecting the data. That dash include context is not something. <laughs> so. so because the current user can decrypt it, it will decrypt it. Yes. Okay. So. That's why we started uh, writing an event log here. So we are telling here, hey, the certificate, this certificate contains a private key. Mm. Protected event logging certificates used for encryption should only contain the public key. So to give ad additional information, so it's, it's not a good practice to have a certificate that has both public and private key on the same machine. Mm -hmm. And oh. private key, you basically put it only on one machine or two machines max. So what's the point in encryption? Yeah. <laughs> so that's why we started giving a warning here in the event log. So we know that people are going to use event log, and this is, and we are giving the same warning in the same event ID four one zero four. So that is visible right up, right away. That is how you, this is how you unprotect the data. So I have one last point uh, to talk about. This is anti malware integration. So this stuff works only on Windows Windows 10. Okay, for the purposes of this discussion, right? No, um, not meaning 12 uh, to 6, what about server 16? Yeah. Next, next version of server. It's only Windows 10 and next version of server. Yeah. So for the purpose of this discussion, right? Let us say the right host pwned is a uh, virus. Can you zoom in? Huh? Yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. I'll can everyone see the screen? Yeah. Yeah, okay. For the purpose of this discussion, let us say right host owned uh, is a uh, virus. Okay. It's not a good good command. So we have uh, worked with uh, uh, Windows uh, Defender anti malware team, and uh, with uh, with together with them, we have created a new API called uh, anti malware uh, software interface API which antivirus vendors can hook into and uh, applications can call into also. Okay, so before a script block uh, is done, we send it to them and instead anti-malware or antivirus can direct, uh, do the uh, detection on the script and then tell us, hey, uh, if this is good or not. So one of the things is, <coughs> So this is actually coming from Antivirus. I'm, I'm taking uh, a signature that is not trusted from Antimalware. So if I run that signature, Antimalware will tell me, hey, this script contains malicious content. It has been blocked by your Antivirus software. So now uh, anti Antivirus vendors can detect PowerShell and tell us, tell to the PowerShell engine, hey, whether a script is valid or not. Yeah. So this is one initial production to Windows 7 and Windows. Is that iCore encrypted or encoded? Pardon? Is that the iCore uh, virus encoded? What did you encode there? Um, this is uh, 
this I told you, I'm showing in this example, I'm showing a technique that hackers would generally <coughs> generally use. It's not uh, we send PowerShell content as is. It's, you don't need to do any encoding. Yeah, yes, yeah, and it's it, it's not just for the whole script and it's not signature based like antivirus. It's each line of code. So the yeah. the malware engine gets a chance to say, I don't like write host because you're going to kill a puppy. It says you can't run write host yeah. or whatever. Um, what are your validation points for making it uh, saying secure or not secure? That antivirus vendor can decide. We send them the script, I have no idea. and then depending on uh, uh, signatures, yeah. yeah. So so I think we ran, ran out of time. Uh, the last question here, uh, what about passwords and the locks? Pardon me? Passwords, clear text passwords. I know it's not uh, ideal, but if you make a get credential, a PS credentials, will that get locked? Or will that be some kind of Lock. Um, secure and not locked uh, information? So uh, the question is whether we lock uh, get credential and uh, username and password in the script lock login, right? Yeah. So, so we log whatever that is passed in the script block. So to protect sensitive data, we recommend using uh, CMS messages. That's specifically what the scenario for the CMS protected yeah. the secure event logging is that when a bad guy cracks a machine, they're looking for sources of information to go crack other machines and spread <coughs> through the network. One of the richest sources of that great information are the event logs. So that's why I invented this technique so that when they get that machine and then they try and harvest the logs, they get nothing. But keep in mind that when you run get credential and it prompts you to enter stuff, the, the stuff that you entered into get credential doesn't get logged. The fact that you ran get credential gets logged. Okay. Um, so the, the values of variables, unless you choose to dump them to the screen, um, they don't show up in your transcript. Yeah, so we're safe there, but there are like existing executables and third party executables that take password on the <coughs> command line. It's yeah. a horrible thing. We're trying to tell them not yeah. to, but it exists. Yep. Yep. Also and and like you say, API keys are frequently plain text. Yeah, you can't. Uh, so if you're doing uh, uh, like a dash header to a <coughs> request or an invoke rest method, sometimes you'll have sensitive data there, and that's where the encrypted log is great. Uh, one question to the anti malware integration. Is it possible that the, the API calls multiple malware software or something mm -hmm. like that? Yeah, so the the API is public, so multiple vendors can implement that API. Yeah, just because this is why it's only Windows 10, it's because it's not a PowerShell feature, it's a Windows feature, yeah. that it's the Windows anti-malware feature that's now extended for scripting. So the anti-malware feature is such that any vendor can come in and take advantage and plug in. It's not only PowerShell, it's uh, it'll do it for BB scripts out of the box too, that or Windows scripts yeah. in general. So it's yeah. generic uh, interface, anybody can implement that. So you could just say, I don't like BB scripts and just have your any malware, just kick those right out. <laughs> <laughs> I like the way you think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or use it to plug in both expression language. Okay, cool. Yeah. I think we are run out of the time. Yeah. Thanks for attending the session. Yeah. Sure,